Will the Falcons get off their butts and make a trade for Hassan Reddick? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked on Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked on Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. So, guys, if you do not know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. the Jolly Green Giant, a.k.a. Mr. A.k.a. And of course, I've been covering the Falcons for far too long, formerly at Falcfans.com, R.I.P. Still going strong in this illustrious podcast, and I appreciate each and every one of you that goes strong with me as an everydayer that makes this illustrious podcast your first listen, your first watch of the day. And all you have to do to join this illustrious club of everydayers is subscribe, or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe is the word I tried to say, but I don't know what came out. Um, Today's episode, you know, we will be pushing back on the pushback because I got a little pushback uh, from someone in Discord uh, by on yesterday's from yesterday's episode where I made the comparison that this offseason feels a lot like a Dimitrov era offseason in terms of the Falcons. Um, basically looking at one problem and ignoring the, the other problems. And I'll, I'll defend my position. Um, but we'll start things off talking about the pass rush or lack thereof because the well has seemingly dried up in terms of good pass rushers left available to enhance this Falcons pass rush. And basically, you're 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 stuck with all the red flag guys, right? All, all the good bets, safe bets, or whatever is just red flag guys. And by red flags, we mean you guys that have either are too old injured or or just or you know the clownies of the world that are just notorious mercenaries at this point in time so clowny is probably the top guy on the market yannick Ngakwe is still out there his his fall has he's his star has fallen so so far uh, <laughs> he, he was like one of the worst pass rushers according to pff last year in the league last year and it's like remember you remember that guy <laughs> carl lawson's still out there so those are kind of the name guys that are still out there but like I've seen a lot more Falcon fans on Twitter and elsewhere being like, hey, you know, might as well bring back Bud Dupree. And like, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of Falcon fans that went into this offseason thinking like good riddance on Bud Dupree. We can do so much better. And now it's like, well, I don't know if we can do better than Bud Dupree. And that's that's kind of where the Falcons are at. So, you know, whether it's bringing back a Bud Dupree, signing another old guy like Marcus Golden, Kyle Van Noy, Jerry Hughes, Justin Houston, Melvin Ingram, you know, all those guys, probably their best days are well behind them. Um, but there, there's still one guy out there that is on the older side of things. He's on the wrong side of 30, but he is a legit needle mover. And that is Hassan Reddick. And we've heard since February that the Eagles are open to trading Hassan Reddick. And they recently pushed back his roster bonus. I believe it is to April 1st to give them more time to work out a deal. Originally, I think it was March 15th. And so basically now they have as I'm recording this, like 10 days to try to work out a trade for Hassan Reddick. And I absolutely think the Falcons should trade for Hassan Reddick. I've listened to recent episodes of Locked on Eagles, and and those guys are saying that if they can't get a late second or third round pick for Reddick, then it's not worth trading him. Um, and with the Falcons having two third round picks, I'd be like, yeah, give them one of those thirds uh, to get Hassan Reddick. Um and then, you know, if you're the Falcons, you'd have to do a new deal for him, which is why I think the Eagles are shopping him because he asked for a new deal. And they're like, oh, well, you, you can get that elsewhere. We're going to pay Bryce Huff and we're going to keep Josh Sweat. And we just drafted Nolan Smith. So we're, we're good on that. And so my guess on what the type of contract Sweat will make is similar to what Daniel Hunter signed with the Texans, um, which was twenty four and a half million dollars over two years with forty eight million dollars guaranteed. And, you know, maybe you get a long term deal in three or four years on that with with uh reddick but somewhere in that 24 25 million dollar range right that's what hunter got that's what montez sweat signed last year rashawn gary signed a similar amount um and that would be a nice raise for hassan reddick uh given that he's entering the last year of a 15 million a year contract that he signed with the eagles a couple of years ago 
And we know that, you know, Reddick has played exceptionally well these last four seasons with four uh, straight 10 sack seasons in Philadelphia, or two of those in Philadelphia and one in Arizona and one in, in Carolina. So clearly, you know, it ain't, he ain't a byproduct of the system is, is basically what I'm getting at. And so, you know, it's been what, eight years since the Falcons had a 10 sack guy on, on their team since Beasley uh, in, the, in 2016. So it will be a welcome change at this point in time. Now, the Falcons currently do not have the cap space to trade for Hassan Reddick. It would cost them about $14 million right now in, in cap space to absorb Reddick's contract. Then you could potentially lower that with a new deal. Again, I don't know exactly how the logistics work. Could could you get him to technically agree to a trade and then sign a new deal bef- and not have to absorb all, all that $14 million? Or do you need to absorb it and then do the deal? Or can you get the Eagles to do the deal and then trade make the trade again. I don't know the, the quite the logistics of that, but right now with the Falcons, depending on how much the Ray Ray McLeod contract is, the Falcons currently have a less than two point five million dollars in cap space, right? That that's assuming that Ray Ray McLeod's only getting the veteran minimum, and they would only have two point five million dollars in cap space. I think two point four to be exactly according to OverTheCap.com. So they would have to do some stuff to to create the roughly twelve million dollars that they would need to do in order to um, do a, a Reddick trade. And you could easily get that, plus get the money, that you, the, the, the 5.8, I think, million dollars that you would need to sign your rookies. Um, if you just restructured three contracts, that would be Jake Matthews, Grady Jarrett, and Chris Lindstrom. That would free up about $26 million in cap space with some max restructures on those guys. So clearly the Falcons have the means if they want to trade for Hassan Reddick, they can do so. Basically, I've just laid out the, the the path to doing it. Now, the question is, do they have, you know, the motivation? Do they want to actually trade for Hassan Reddick? And for me, looking at the fact that the Falcons have kind of dragged their feet on creating this extra cap space, whether it's via restructures, whether it's cuts like cutting Heineke and Carter, Lorenzo Carter and, and Mike Hughes, that would create like $14 million in cap space if they cut all three of those guys. The fact that they haven't done that or done any of those moves to me, you know, tells me that they're not necessarily super motivated for that. Right. And roughly we have a rough deadline for when the deal needs to get done, or at least seemingly when Philadelphia is very open to doing a deal, which is April 1st. So 10 days. Um, And so it doesn't feel like the Falcons have any sense of urgency given where we sit today. Now, maybe, you know, maybe news changes and, and news is broken, uh, since I've recorded this episode or, or something along those lines where the Falcons have reworked some contracts or made some cuts or something along those lines. So, but as I sit here today in the world that exists right now, as I'm talking to you into this microphone, that is not the world we live in right now. So I would love to see the Falcons make a trade for the Son Reddick, but at this point in time, without the Falcons doing some, you know, cap maneuvering, I'm not going to hold my breath that we're going to see something happen on that re- front, you know, in the next 10 days. And so therefore I'm at a point where I'm just assuming that the Falcons will just wait till the draft to address their pass rush. Right. And then if, if they don't address it in the way that they wouldn't want to, then we might see them be more proactive in May and June to maybe make some of these moves. So we'll see how that goes, but you know, I would love to come on this podcast at some point in the next 10 days and, and talk about, Oh my God, what it, you know, Terry was laying in a cut and he, he, you know, he was, he was playing the long game the entire time all that stuff, maybe waiting to the last minute to get the maximum leverage in Howie. Cause you know, you know, no one wants to do a deal with Howie, uh, <laughs> but you know, we'll see. But you know, in terms of what Reddick will bring on the football field, he's, you know, a, a tear off the edge speed rusher. We talked about this last year when we were talking about the possibility of the Falcons taking Nolan Smith at the top of last year's draft, where basically the player that you want Nolan Smith to grow into in like three or four years, Hassan Reddick is already that player in terms of, being that guy that has a great fastball in terms of speed rush off the edge. And then when you couple that as the Eagles have done the last couple of years with some interior push, and hopefully the Falcons will do that with Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata and, and hopefully some more additions, um, you know, up front this off season uh, in, on that interior D line, you know, that's a great one, two combination that you can build a really viable pass rush uh, here in Atlanta. So if the Falcons aren't going to go after Hassan Reddick, then, you know, my next my my plan C's, I guess, would be at this point would be like Kyle Van Noy or Carl Lawson at this point in time. Just get some veterans in here that are competent players 
uh, that, you know, if Lawson is healthy, I know he's dealing with a back injury last year, you know, he can provide some juice. Kyle Van Noy is coming off one of his better seasons, very solid role player, not necessarily going to be a guy that scares you as a pass rusher, but can it be your reliable, you know, five to eight sack guy, I think, uh, which, you know, I would, that's, you know, beggars can't be choosers, as I often say. So, um, you know, if, if, if the Falcons did go out there and, and, and sign one of these guys, I would take back some of the criticism. You know, I take back most of the criticism. They went out and got Reddick. Uh, but I take back some of the criticism I've already leveled at sort of the lackluster, underwhelming offseason that they've done so far. But, you know, one listener didn't take kindly to me saying that on yesterday's episode and comparing this offseason to a Dimitrov era one. And I will respond to his response to that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. Now, guys, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp, and a lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. I know if I had more time, you know, I'd be grinding more film on the lead up to the draft, but how would you spend your extra time? And a better way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. And therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. And therapy has taught me coping skills like I can only control what I can control. Some of the things I can control is how I use my time. Uh, And if you're looking for coping skills, if you're looking for things that you can prioritize in your life, uh, why not give BetterHelp a try, right? Therapy is great. Uh, it's entirely done online via BetterHelp, designed to be convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. All you got to do is fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, dot com slash locked on. So, guys, want to plug the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel right here on YouTube. First of its kind, getting all the biggest stories from all the local experts across all the leagues. Locked On Sports Today. If you're looking for more local in- expertise, then check out Locked On Sports Atlanta's 24-7 streaming channel right here on YouTube, as well as the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. So, our next question comes from the Discord, which comes from Crunkles. He asks, he says... Aaron, I I love the latest episode as always. I did have one thought, though. I disagree with you saying that this was like a Thomas Dimitrov offseason with the Falcons only addressing one need. They went out and got a quarterback, a blocking tight end, and speed at the receiver position. Also, we knew they would likely add more than one receiver in free agency. That's three needs addressed so far. Sure, that's probably one more wide receiver than we expected, but it's not as a bad start to the beginning of the offseason even if we may not love every signing. That also disregards the O-line and D-line depth signings, which are low-key solid signings. From what I've heard, the Falcons were targeting some rather high-level defensive talent, but we weren't just able, we weren't, we were, sorry, I can't read, guys, (laughs) but we just weren't able to land them, and they signed elsewhere. That's the downside of throwing money at Kirk, but we knew that would be the case. The front office needs to start making cuts and restructures at this point, Maybe we can snag one more decent dude for our defense after that. All in all, that's a pretty good start, in my opinion. So what I will say, Crunkles, is, you know, and for anybody else that that disagrees with me, you are welcome to disagree with me. But hopefully, by the end of today's episode, you will understand where I'm coming from with this. So, um, you know, yes, we did add a blocking tight end. Uh, I would argue that Charlie Warner is more of a lateral move from Parker Hesse, but obviously Parker Hesse wasn't doing anything last year, much to my chagrin. Uh, so it is an upgrade, but I, I don't know if it's like a super, you know, like I felt like we already had the means to fill that need on the roster, but the Falcons just chose not to fill that need. So um, I like the Charlie Warner move. Don't get me wrong, but like I tend to, after watching film, tend to agree with what Brian Peacock of Locked On 49 said. I think that was yesterday's episode where like he's a good blocker, but I don't know if he's an impact blocker. Right. So. Speed up wide receiver. I don't know if the Falcons are dramatically faster than what they were a year ago, right? Like if I was ranking all the receivers that they've had over the last six months, I would put Scotty Miller as the fastest. Then I'd probably put Darnell Mooney slightly ahead of Van Jefferson. And then I would probably put Van Jefferson slightly ahead of Rondell Moore in terms of speed. Then there's Ray Ray McLeod. Then there's Kadero Hodge. And then there's Mac Hollins. So they are collectively faster just because Ray Ray McLeod's faster than Mac Hollins um, is. But like, I don't know if, Mooney and Moore are bringing a lot more juice than what Miller or Jefferson are. And overall, like I, I just, I don't see this current group of wide receivers 
really moving the needle, you know, outside of Drake London. Right. And, you know, I'm going to be doing a video for Locked On Falcons Insiders this week talking about all these new free agent signings. Um, and basically, you know, spoiler alert to those who haven't watched it yet um, or aren't inside it in insiders, you know, basically all these guys are kind of gadget yak guys. And that's fine. You know, we, we talked before that Kirk Cousins is not necessarily going to do a lot of pushing the ball down the field. So having guys that can win after the catches is, is a valuable way to build your wide receiver core, um, you know, given that you're not going to necessarily be tossing bombs all day. But to me, like, that's fine. But at the end of the day, like, you still need a guy that when it's third and seven, that you can just win and get open. And I don't really think anybody that the Falcons have added is the guy that I would really trust in those situations. And that's part of the reason why I make the Dimitrov comp, because it's so similar to me of the 2019 offseason when the Falcons went out and, and signed or re-signed Ty Sambrello and, and paid a lot of money for James Carpenter and Jamon Brown. And one of the things I said on the podcast then, when I was being Mr. Drew, uh, back then, uh, that negative Nancy was that those moves didn't really solve the Falcons offensive line problems. And they still needed to draft O-line help early in the 2019 draft while everybody else was like, oh, no, we don't need to worry about offensive line. We can circle back to that later in the draft. We need to get a pass rusher, right? We need to get Ed Oliver. We need to get Brian Burns. Those are the two guys that I recall a lot of people coveting in that 2019 draft. And that also factors in that the Falcons were showing a lot of trust in, oh, Vic Beasley's going to have a bounce back year at that point. Um, and we saw the Falcons do address their offensive line in the draft and it eventually paid off for them down the road. Uh, but them not being able to address their pass rush as so many people wanted them to do, that's what I mean where it compounds, right? That's what I was talking about where you compound these issues down the road. And that compounded the next offseason where the Falcons didn't have to overpay for Dante Fowler and they had to draft Marlon Davidson. And, and it just kept continuing and continuing where they weren't able to not only because they were spending all this money, on all these resources on the offensive line, that they were not using those resources on the pass rush. And it wasn't like they were doing a good job investing those resources on the offensive line. And that's what it feels like to me where the Falcons have added these three wide receivers, but like it's not a great investment, right? And, you know, one argument is like, oh, well, they're spending less money. Not really, because like if you look at Sambrello, Carpenters and Brown's contracts, they combine for about twenty five million dollars in guaranteed money across those three contracts. And if you extrapolate what twenty nineteen cap dollars are to twenty twenty four cap dollars, that would be about thirty five million dollars uh, in terms of guaranteed money today. And when you factor in Darnell Mooney's twenty six million dollars in guaranteed, you know, Moore's contract isn't guaranteed, but let's just say. 1.6 million that we're paying him this year. And then you, if you assume that, you know, McLeod got two or $3 million guaranteed on his deal, you're talking about about $30 million. So it's not that far off in terms of the expenditure and in terms of resources, when we compare it to that 2019 off season with the offensive line thing. So that's why I sit here similar to I was heading in that 2019 draft being like, you know, wide receiver at eight still makes a ton of sense because you need to get someone who actually is going to make a difference for your football team, not just a guy that's kind of a lateral move to what you had last year. Like, again, I don't think this group of receivers is, you know, significantly better than last year's group of receivers. Like if last year's group was a five out of 10, then this year's is a six out of 10, which again is a step in the right direction. But, you know, I, I don't know if it's worth what, what the Falcons have uh, spent so far. So, um, you know, it feels like to me, the Falcons are given their investments or lack thereof, in my opinion, at the wide receiver position, they're still making the bet that they're going to run their entire offense through their big three, which is Bijan, Kyle Pitts and, and Drake London, which is fine. Um, and I'm hoping that Zach Robinson is going to do a better job, you know, doing that than Arthur Smith did that. And if he is, then essentially the Falcons are basically, we're going to be last year's lions team, which, you know, their big three were Amon Ross St. Brown, Jameer Gibbs and, and Sam Laporta. And, you know, David Montgomery was also a big part of that. And we'll, we'll make Tyler Algier our, our David Montgomery. And with Ben Johnson being arguably one of the top five play callers in the league and Jared Goff playing some of the best ball he's ever seen, you know, it worked for the lions and they were in a position where they were, you know, in a position to go to the Super Bowl last year. And it didn't matter that their, you know, next tier of receivers are Josh Reynolds and Khalif Raymond and, and Jameis Williams. And I know Jameis Williams is a very talented player, but, you know, he wasn't showing that consistently last year. So we'll see what happens with him moving forward. And then you had the one of the arguably the best offensive line of football 
uh, blocking in front of that. And so, like, you can see a lot of parallels between the Falcons and that Lions team. But th- that bet is basically betting on Zach Robinson being this superstar offensive coordinator right away, which maybe he is. But, like, I'm not a big fan of betting on unknowns or making big bets on unknowns. Like, I'll make a small bet on unknowns. And so for me, like, if I'm going to make a big bet, like, I want to have some safeguards. I want to have some fallbacks, you know, some insurance policies. And and that's what I think is missing where, like, I, I need another difference maker, especially at that wide receiver position, that makes me feel a lot better about whatever bet we're making on Zach Robinson, right? Excuse me. That when I look at Darnell Mooney as the team's de facto number two wide receiver, like, he's in that sort of Harry Douglas – Russell Gage, Muhammad Sanu tier of wide receiver that we've had in Atlanta, which to me is ideally a number three, but can be a functional number two. But what those guys had where they were playing opposite someone like Julio Jones, which was, you know, arguably the best wide receiver in the league at that point in time. And this is what I was talking about last year with Mac Hollins, where it's like, yeah, Mac Hollins is a fine number two when he's playing next to Devontae Adams, but it's different when he's playing next to Drake London. And again, maybe Drake London is that dude, right? I don't think I don't think he's Julio. I don't think he's Devontae Adams, but maybe maybe, you know, we will see Zach Robinson. You know, if you would ask me if Puka Nakua or Cooper Cup were that type of dude, I would have said no. But we saw Sean McVay turn those guys into that type of, you know, true blue number one, high volume, 150, 160, 180 target type of guys that Julio Jones did on on a semi-regular basis. But that was Sean McVay doing it. So again, you're betting on Zach Robinson basically being Sean McVay at that point in time with Drake London, if, if Drake London isn't inherently that dude. So that's what I mean where like, I don't, I don't love those bets. Right. And I just saw a coach make a very similar bet and it didn't work. And so now you're like, let's do that again. And it's like, all right, like it could work this time, you know, but like, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Where I'm just like, I don't feel great about that bet. So we'll see how that goes. That's, that's why I compare it to the, the Dimitrov, but I, I do want to circle back to the latter part of your question, talking about the Falcons missing on some of that high level defensive talent um, and whether or not, you know, they have a plan B, you know, in terms of getting the pass rusher like they seemingly had when they were targeting Kirk Cousins. So we'll break that down to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. Guys, you got to say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel is going to let you bet on every game of this year's NCAA tournament. Whether you're betting on the big upset, the one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. That's right. New customers at FanDuel get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. And it's not just March Madness. You can check out FanDuel, of course. So many things going on in the sports world, NHL. I mean, FanDuel's out here, you know, putting odds out there for, you know, award shows and whatnot. But, you know, especially for those of us that are really invested in, you know, what the Falcons are going to do and what really any team is going to do in the 2024 NFL draft, FanDuel has great odds for that. You know, eighth overall selection, who's the first defensive player to go? When, when do the quarterbacks go off? You can find it all by going to FanDuel.com slash locked on and you can bet on the NFL draft. You can bet on anything and you can especially bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. So wrapping up today's Locked on Falcons, I want to uh, answer the latter part of Krunkle's um, question from Discord, and I'll repeat it. He says, from what I've heard, the Falcons were targeting some rather high-level defensive talent, but we just weren't able to land them, and they signed elsewhere. That's the downside of throwing money at Kirk, We, but we knew that would be the case. The front office needs to start making some cuts and restructures at this point. Maybe we snag one more decent dude for our defense after that all in all that's a pretty good start in my opinion so i think that's a fair point crunkles um you know what you're talking about is referring to what albert breer of sports illustrated reported earlier this week um talking about how the falcons not only were in on kirk cousins but were also seemingly in on christian wilkins and daniel hunter um and you know the that report also implied that the Falcons had a plan B, which was either going to be Justin Fields and Baker Mayfield if they weren't able to land Kirk Cousins, right? And so to me, I guess for me, it's like if they had a plan B at quarterback, why don't they have a plan B in terms of pass rush, right? If they weren't going to get Wilkins or Hunter, what was their plan B to addressing the pass rush? Um, So that that's kind of where I'm at, right? You know, and hopefully that's Hassan Reddick. Um, but 
we haven't seen anything come to fruition at this point in time. So, you know, in general, I agree with you. I think they got off to a, a good start this offseason. I just think for me, it's kind of petered out. That's that's to me my issue. It's like basically Monday through Wednesday, hey, I'm hey, this is looking pretty good. This is a great start. And then ever since then, it's just been like, all right, like th this is it. Like that's where the difference. But I'm sure like part of it is as you mentioned, you're much more optimistic that we'll see more additions. Um and we'll we'll see, right? Again, you know, they make a Hassan Reddick trade. We'll, we'll be having a very different conversation on, on this podcast. But to me, it doesn't seem like anything is on the horizon because they passed up the savings that they could have made from cutting Taylor Heineke or Mike Hughes and or uh, Lorenzo Carter, which would have saved them up to $14 million in cap space. Um, and while I know everybody's going to comment and say, you know, well, they could still cut those guys. Yes, technically they still could still cut those guys. But the fact that they haven't already to me speaks volumes, right? It speaks volumes to a lack of motivation that, you know, with pretty much, they have the fewest amount of cap space of any team in the NFL right now. And so like, where's your, where's that sense of, that's what I mean with the sense of urgency. Like if you are in the market to add more to your roster, like what, what are we waiting for? That's, that's where I'm, I'm struggling with. And so, you know, I know a lot of people assume that when I'm talking about the Falcons taking a wide receiver at eight, like I'm, against the idea of the Falcons investing in their pass rush. And I'm like, I'm very much in favor of the Falcons investing in their pass rush. But to me, the way that they structured this offseason, it was like an either or choice. And it, to me, it never had to be that sort of either or choice where it's like, well, we can only really solve one of these issues. And like, to me, all the resources they've poured into the wide receiver didn't solve the issue. And so that's why, again, going back to what I said earlier, but, you know, I, I care deeply about the Falcons investing in their pass rush. And I hope we get to see a plan B come to fruition that isn't just relying on, on the Falcons drafting, you know, a, a rookie and relying on a rookie to come in and, and be this transformative presence, you know, and, and hoping that they hit on a Will Anderson or type of player, which maybe they do, right? You know, Dallas Turner was more productive than Will Anderson at Gala. So maybe, maybe it works out that way, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But like, for me, it was like, all, all season long, I was like, the Falcons have eight problems, right? And two of those problems are the coach and the quarterback. Um, but two of those problems, to me, were, like, related to their pass rush. Like, I wanted two more difference makers up front, right? And so, like, for me, like, quantifying those eight problems, head coach, quarterback, stabilizing the run game, right? Getting more playmakers at the wide receiver position. You know, five and six are those two difference makers up front. Seven and eight are, you know, a corner and a safety in the secondary. Now, I'm sure Crunkles and, and many of you others, you feel like we've added the playmakers at wide receiver. I don't think so. To me, they just solved the two problems, the coach and the quarterback, and they've kind of ignored the other ones. And, you know, while I don't think it was realistic that the Falcons or likely, let me say that, that the Falcons were going to solve all eight of those problems, it did feel realistic to me that they could legitimately like check five or more of those problems off the table. And I just feel like the fact that they're only going to do two and then, you know, if we're going to count the first and second round picks as, you know, checking two more boxes, it's like, all right, like maybe we get four if we hit on those rookies. But as you guys know, the draft is a crapshoot. So we'll see how that goes. So the all season isn't over, like, but it just feels like things are winding down and it feels so similar to me of those off seasons in 20, from 2013 to 2020, where the Falcons just seem to always do the bare minimum to address their issues. And, you know, that to me was their major issue with, they weren't always great at self-evaluating. And, you know, that was one of the things I constantly got on the table. It's like, I'm watching the film too, and I can sit here and tell you, like, this is a problem, this is a problem. And the Falcons are like, no, we disagree. And then, like, you know, a year later, I'm like, hey, this problem still exists. And then the Falcons are like, oh, yeah, this is a problem. Let's address it. And it's like, all right. I wonder who possibly could have said that that was an issue. But, you know, it's not like I'm bitter, guys. I'm, I'm not bitter. I'm, I'm, I'm so humble, right? But... That's that's going to do it. So, Crunkles and, and anybody else, I hope you understand why I, I think the way I think. You, you're more than welcome to disagree with me, but that's that's kind of how I feel about it. But that's going to do it for us here. We'll be back with a Mock Draft Monday um, next week. I know uh, Josh Kendall for The Athletic did a recent one where they traded back and got a corner at pick 12, I think. So maybe that's something we talk about on Monday. But continue to check out Locked on Falcons. Uh, check out Locked on Sports today. Locked On Sports Atlanta. It's all part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.